guests today, and I have my co-host uh, Matt Rogers here uh, from the Hive Mind. Um, David Richter is interesting person. So we went to high school back together. Uh, went to high school together years ago. Um, it's it been twelve years now. <laughs> yeah, a lifetime ago. A lifetime ago, about a third of our life ago. <laughs> right. A, th- a third of our life ago, we w- went to the same school, and it's just been uh, interesting coming circling back into the same kind of people. So it's interesting. It's very interesting. So, um, have you always been an entrepreneur? I guess not. No, because I started out working in college at just the normal, you know, normal job. I was at a warehouse, you know, doing, doing things there as a machinist and as an operator, as a, you know, operating forklifts and stuff. So no, I wasn't always an entrepreneur, but read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad in college too. So a friend of mine gave me that book. So it's kind of what unlocked like, oh, wow, there's a whole nother world out there and another, a whole nother way of thinking than what I've thought of to this point. So that's kind of what kicked me off on the entrepreneurial journey. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I always, I always like asking that question because some people, it's just di- different varying backgrounds and yep. they kind of go any direction. And so I'm like, and I, I, I didn't know, like I said, a lot of people worked at the at different places and call centers mm-hmm. and such back in the day. That's where I came from, the call center. But nice. I easy don't, easy don't mention that one. I, I was like, I'm a truck driver. That sounds yes. better. <laughs> right. So um, one thing I'm curious about, so how long have you been in real estate? So you got into real estate right after college. Yeah, during college. It was 2012, so about 10 years now. Uh, that was when I bought my first deal. So I read to Rich Dad Poor Dad and said, I got to do something with this knowledge. So I actually used a realtor in the local area when there was deals everywhere. And so Sherry picked one off the MLS. It was a HUD foreclosure property, Wow. fixed it up and uh, actually rented it for a while. So cash flowed it, had pretty good cash flow uh, back in the day. And then also lived in it once I first got married. So that was the first house that I lived in. Then eventually we moved out of that house and I lease option that property and put a lease option tenant inside there. And then that tenant cashed me out six months later. So that was a fun first deal for me. So that's kind of how I got started into it and did a couple different things with that property. And from there, did a lot of deals with a lot of investors up there in Northwest Indiana, where we were, Um, was part of a company there where we took it from five deals to 25 deals a month, doing wholesale, fix and flip, turnkey, lease options, rentals, like everything in between. So seen a lot in the last 10 years in the real estate world and done a lot of different types of deals and sat in a lot of different seats as a real estate investor. Man, that is awesome. So I I think it's funny because you you actually lease option your first property. I did the same thing too. I lease optioned it. I'm still waiting for him to buy me out, but if I would have sold it with a realtor, I would have only made like 20 K and I got Mm. 30 K down. I make 500 a month for two years. And then whenever he cashes me out, I should make like 60 K on it. Right. Nice. There you go. That's the way to do it. So I'm like, I'm like, yes, these options yep. for the win. Like, yes. I'm going to leverage my own mortgage. <laughs> there it is. It's good stuff. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So one, one thing I'm really curious about, so I didn't know you were in there for 10 years. Cause I think um, you said you've done over like 700 transactions. Mm-hmm. Over 850. So between, between being with that company and the deals I've done, cause I've done fix and flips or wholesale. And then also I had a little rental portfolio too, but yeah, I've been a part of over 850 deals up to this point. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I mean, 10 years is a long time too. It is. It Looking back on it, yeah, it's, it feels like it's been, like, I can't believe it's only been 10 years since, you know, like I bought that first house. Um, but it's also like, wow, a lot has happened in the last 10 years, you know, got married, have a little daughter now, you know, lots of, lots of life changes will move from that area now in Florida. So yeah, it's a lot can happen in 10 years. So if you're listening to this now and you're like, I'm just starting out, five, 10 years can change a whole lot. If you start listening to good people like Daniel and Matt here and taking their advice and getting on hive mind. So David, you know, for the newer investors who maybe haven't done their first deal or have done a couple and are looking to get more of a foothold in the industry, can you talk about your first year or two in the business? You know, it sounds like you were able to find a great deal in the MLS back when those were very kind of easy to find and prevalent. What steps did you take after that to start ensuring that you're able to, to source great deals and, and be able to, to do the things that you're able to do now? So I found a local investor in the area 
and basically said, I'll work for free. You know, like uh, I've got a day job, but I'll work nights, weekends, whatever. So I did that with that investor for about eight months, learned a ton during that time. And then after eight months, he offered me a you know position there. So I was like, heck yeah, because I like want to learn the business and I want to do more of these deals. So that's where I got into it and started learning. I not only was now learning how to acquire a property, the bigger thing now was I was learning how to run a business, what to do, what not to do, how to grow it. You know, like it was just so much more because they had when we like when I said when we started, they were doing about five deals a month. And they had about five people, but then we started growing and started doing other transaction types. So that whole, it was basically pay to play because I was getting paid to, you know, to pay, to play the game and also to help provide value to them, you know, and to, uh, and then I eventually bought a couple of deals from them as well too, and as well as sourcing my own. But that to me was the quicker path to success than me just saying, okay, let me dump some money into marketing and like, let me get it set up. So I kind of wanted to learn the business at that time before I, you know, jumped in with both feet. And it was a, it was an awesome working and learning experience during that time was there for five years and, you know, built a little side portfolio as well too, sourcing deals from, you know, the company and from other places as well. So it was a good ride and learned a lot of good lessons, but I would say if someone's starting out first, it's getting around people like you guys, you know, like listening to the content you put out, listening, you know, like what value can you bring to them? Like, do you have a certain set of skills? Cause like me, Daniel probably knows, you know, like in school, I was pretty studious, you know, I was like more operational, you know, so that into the business world that translated into more like I could help you with your systems, your processes, you know, that type of stuff. And that was what I went in there to help them with. And so, so started helping them like, Let's get the acquisition set up. So I did acquisitions, you know, and like direct to seller, moved to dispositions and selling the property, got that set up and started. Then I moved to the um, transaction coordination, did that, did project management and the flips, got that started. Property management when we started getting more deals and then eventually the finance seat and accounting seat as well too. So I was kind of like the go in, you know, get the process down and then do that. So that's kind of the skill set I had. So if you're listening and you're just starting out. What skill set do you have? Are you good on the phone? If you're good on the phone, you're going to eat well anywhere in any real estate company because that's the people that they're always looking for. It's like if you're good on the phone and can close deals. But yeah, that's how I got started. And, you know, I would just say if you can provide value to someone, you'll, you're going to get that value back. Now, Daniel, this is this is the second time that we've heard this from from our last two guests, you know, suggesting that, hey, you know, instead of going out alone, get a job with a company and learn the ropes from inside. And, and like David was talking about paying to play, you know, you get paid to play. And I think that is, that's a huge point to learn on the job and, and not have to, you can make mistakes. I don't want to say on someone else's dime, but you have a little layer of cushion and protection to make, to learn and grow and not feel like the way of the world's on your shoulders to, you know, have to, uh, you know, go out and hunt and, and do everything on your own. Yeah. And that's where, uh, that book that's come out in the last few years, who, not how it was like, that's kind of the who that I was searching for at that time with, before the book was coming out, I was like, this was what my path, what I wanted it to look like and how I thought I could get there faster. And it was a great, like I said, great learning experience. Now starting a couple different businesses over my lifetime now, and like what to do, what not to do. And just, you know, getting those, that real hands-on experience of seeing a, a small company grow into a little, you know, doing 25, 30 deals a month and 300 deals a year. So it was a, it was a lot of fun. And like you said, getting to be around those people and really learn from them. So I have a question. So yeah. you're integrators. So integrate, I feel like integrators that sometimes struggle to find their right yang to their yin. <laughs> and um, I found mine and it works out very well. There's a, I know a lot of integrators that struggle to find their place in business just because they don't really, they, not, they might not be good on the phones. They might not be good in negotiations. They might not be good in person. Like, and I'm even, I'm even alluding to now, like now you've kind of maybe hired that position. Right. Uh, now I've got a, to now that I have my own business and all that, I, I have a lot of visionary inside of me too, but right. That's where I have to make sure I have the right integrator. Got a great guy on our team that is an absolute, an absolute, he's the epitome of an integrator type operator and is really good at our CFO direction and making sure we have everything for our operations team. So yes, it is finding those right people. 
And I'm no, I'm not the best salesperson. So that's where it's like, I have to have the right salesperson. I have to write the, have the right finance person. I, my specific skill set is business development. I like that a lot. I like finding the key players, the culture, the people, the numbers, like the job of a CEO. So that was where once I started my own business, it was like, I can't just be the hunter gatherer and like killing the deals and taking them down. I now have to learn how to be that leader and that developer of other people because I need other people to do that. So I'm not always doing that. So I can focus on how do I grow this business? How do I expand it? How do I have, how do I triple, you know, the team member base and how do I triple the client base instead of just like going out there hunting one at a time. So yeah, it's been definitely been a journey, a growing journey. And yeah, finding those right people, it is, it is hard. It's for that yin to your yang, you know, type thing, the integrator, visionary, and really making sure that it's someone that fits your core values. It fits the, you know, all the things that you need to make sure that's going to make you successful over a long period of time. So it's definitely something that as you start your own business, something to start working on right away, becoming more of that leader, attracting the right people, and really always always, you know, it's like always be closing. It's like always have your eyes open for that person because they're out there. They are out there right now. That yin to your yang is out there. And it's like, you have no idea where they're going to come from. So that's just like, always have your eye open for the good people you can bring on your team. Yeah, that, that was good. I, and I, I, I think, I think me and you resonate in that same part because like, I think, I think we're on the, we're on the same level. Probably. Yeah. But it's kind of interesting though, because I can, I can play both sides too, because I'm running my own businesses. So I have to be the visionary in those cases, but in hive mind's case, I'm the, I'm the integrator. Mm, so mm -hmm. I can, I play both. I play, I play my hats. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, well we do. We wear a lot of different hats, especially if you have different businesses like that. Yeah. It's like, sometimes you have to be sitting in that seat in one, you know, the integrator operator, but then in the other ones, you've got a good team around you. So you can't be more the visionary and like, here's the direction. Here's where we're going here's the accountability, you know, that I'm going to hold you to and then run, you know, run as fast as you can. So let's kind of dive into what you're doing now. So you yeah. said you worked for five, five years for that company, kind of split off the drone thing. That's been seven years now. So what do you, what, what, what kind of businesses are you running now? Sure. So once I left there, I had sold a lot of my holdings to at that time, which allowed me to travel, do whatever. So I moved across the country to work with another investor because I like partnering up. You know, it's like, I like that type of deal because honestly too, I don't want to just build anything from the ground up. So that's where I started working with another investor. And the first thing was I started with the finances because I'm like, the numbers don't lie. After sitting in that seat and knowing how the numbers influenced everything, you know, from marketing and knowing my returns on investment to selling the properties and making sure that this is what we had into the property. And this is what we're selling it for to make the true profit here on this property. You know, like getting that education and sitting in that seat. When I went to somewhere else, it was like the first thing. I don't care what you tell me about your business. Show me your numbers. Like I need to see your numbers and see if this is a legitimate operation. So I did a dove in and there weren't numbers, you know, like there wasn't a lot, there was stuff set up, but it like wasn't in the right place or whatnot. So I went in and said, Hey, we got to fix this. We got to have clear metrics here so we can hold ourselves accountable and hold our team members accountable. So we went in, cleaned up their financials over three months. And then from there was able to see that this investor I was working with, he had a portfolio and he was very under leveraged. Like he had like 30% loan to value on his property. So only had a 30% mortgage, you know, on the total investment on his property or what the property was worth. So he said, yeah, I'd love to be at like 50 or 60. I'm comfortable at, you know, 50 or 60% loan to value. So then he was able to pull out a bunch of cash. And then he said something to me, which started this next business. He said, knowing the numbers has given me more clarity more confidence. And this has changed my life, like going through this process. So to me, that was a huge light bulb of like, I bet you a lot of investors are good at making the money, but like don't necessarily spend a lot of time on the financial side to see what the levers are that can really turbocharge their cash holdings, their business, their, you know, their leverage, their, you know, their profitability. So that's where I started calling mentors and was like, Hey, what do you think about me starting a business of, you know, like helping investors with their financials from someone who's been in real estate investing and can actually speak both languages, real estate and the numbers. And they were all like, yeah, I think that would be great. I'd have a bunch of people to, you know, that could help, you know, you could help with that service. And one of my mentors, Gary Harper, he told me like, Hey, have you read profit first? And so I was like, no, I've never read profit first. So I, I downloaded that book by Mike McCowitz, read it in one evening 
took 10 pages of notes and said, this is a great framework for the cash flow management piece of businesses. So that's where I kind of got the profit first bug and, you know, of saying like, okay, we got to at least manage the cash. You know, that's one of the big pieces that's missing. And one of the biggest pieces in real estate, like, come on. I mean, up and down all the time. If you're wholesaling, flipping, you know, you'll have a $200,000 a month and then you'll have like a $50,000 or a $10,000 a month. It's like the roller coaster is real. So that's where I was like, okay, I want to start this, put this framework in place. So that's where I started a fractional CFO company to help investors with their finances, to have kind of a different person than a bookkeeper who's more transactional, CPA who more works for the IRS and making sure your ducks are in a row for them. The CFO is that business strategist. They're the financial business strategist on the team coordinating all of that and making sure you actually have profitability. So that's where I started that company to be able to do that and implement profit first and give people clarity and confidence in their numbers. That's a valuable resource too for, for investors and those who, like you said before, know how to make the money, but maybe struggle to know how to hang on to it or where to allocate right. it. Are there yeah. a couple of things you see over and over again when you work with investors that make um, maybe some of the same common moves that you see that you can go in and clean up? Is there anything that kind of sticks out that happens over and over again you see? Sure. So the biggest thing that I see as a mistake is a lot of investors work and just business owners in general have one big bank account where everything goes in and everything goes out of, including personal. But that's a whole nother story, commingling. Let's not go down that rabbit hole. But where you have one big bank account, everything goes in and out. One day you feel like a king, especially in real estate, a king or queen, because you've got a you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in there from your private lenders and all those people supplying you money from, you know, for your deals. Then the next day it all goes out for all the rehab projects. You got payroll running, marketing running and all those things running out. And then the next day you feel like a pauper because you've got like a thousand dollars in there. So that's where, you know, that's where we see a lot of people, they have that one bank account. It gives them no clarity. It gets, it's like, I, where'd all my money go? You know, that's the, the most common question that I get when people are describing their finances is, I don't know where my money is going. You know, I feel like I'm making a lot, but I have no idea where it goes. And that one of the biggest reasons and mistakes that people can make is that having that one big bank account. So that's where the premise of profit first comes into play, because it's all about separating it out, getting clarity, getting around that. But that's one of the biggest ones. The second one is just sticking their head in the sand. Like once they go down this road and start making some money on some deals, they're like, I'll get to bookkeeping later or I'll get to the finances later. And then it's like three years later, they're coming to me and they're like, I have nothing set up. Help me. And it's like, well, now you're growing so fast that it's like, we got to put some foundations in place first of just getting the numbers in there and like helping you get to just square one of knowing that we can't even do like the fun stuff yet of like analyzing those numbers and like forecasting out where you're going to be and like, what do you want to invest in or what do you want to take home for your pay or whatnot? So that's where don't put your head in the sand, like get a simple system and make sure that you implement it like a profit first or something like that to at least get a hold of your cash. Then the first one of your first hires for a real estate investor should be admin slash bookkeeper. So that way they don't have to do that because like we all know, most of us are not that person. We're not the numbers person. So we need to get that off our plate so we don't have to, you know, worry about that and kick the can down the road until it becomes just a gigantic mess. Cause now you're doing 10 deals a month and like, I have nothing in place. So those are coming some of the big mistakes I see right out of the gate with a lot of people. So is your book more of a DIY type of deal where you instruct them how to come up with the right, the right plan to make sure they manage it themselves? Right. So Profit First, the original book, gives a great framework for, for managing the cash. This book is more for the real estate investor. That The original book by Mike Michalowicz, Profit First, was more for any type of business, service, anything, you know, like brick and mortar, where my book, Profit First for Real Estate Investing, takes that same framework, but applies it to real estate. And all I know is real estate language. So it's full of stories, people that I, you know, we've worked with before in the past and just very directly towards real estate. And it gives them, yes, not only the mindset and all that, but like, here's practical steps because the two big things of profit first that I feel like separates it even from a rich dad, poor dad, or from a, you know, richest man in Babylon is it not just tells you like pay yourself first and like take your profit first and like teaches you that mindset. It also says, here's some practical steps. Here's a system for you to be able to implement and be able to know where your cash is going. So yes, I detail it out in there. So that's why I wanted to say, 
even if you're new and can't work with us, you know, or like are at that level of where you're just starting out, at least get the book and at least read the book and implement it because you can start it from the very beginning. I was on a podcast. Well, my pod, I've got the Profit First REI podcast and I had a guest on there. And he said, if I would have just started this system just from the bare bones at the very beginning, I'd have $5 million more in my account right now today. And I was like, picking myself off off the floor. And that's like where I said, you got it. That's why I need to get this message out no matter where you are in your journey. Because this book and this mindset is about being profitable from your first deal or your next deal, if you're already doing deals. So that's really what the core message is, is you don't have to do more deals or buy more rentals to be more profitable. You just need to take your profit first. Wow, that's awesome. I think that's why why I like like, like your story. I like the product because it really... My, my goal is to help people make more money. Your goal is to help people keep more money. Right, exactly. And not from just the aspect of like, you hear a lot of financial people say that. Usually they're talking about, okay, how do we pare down your expenses or how do we, you know, like save money on your taxes or whatnot, which is all great. That is all great. But you also want to actually keep more money for you. Like you want an account that is just specifically for you so you could take more home and make bring home the bacon for you and your family. So that's what the book is about. This isn't a bunch of tax tips or whatnot. It's about how to keep more cash inside your pockets instead of always paying everyone else first and feeling like, why the heck did I even start this business? That's really interesting. And one of the things you touched on earlier, which I think most investors can relate to, uh, especially in the beginning, is kind of the boom and bust nature of month to month uh, yeah. deal flow, uh, where you said, you know, one month you might make 100 grand and the next month you might make 10 grand or, you know, you might go from 20 grand to three grand, whatever the swings may be. What are some things you can kind of do to put in place on those months where deal flow is light? Maybe things just aren't lining up or closing the way they should. And maybe you string together a couple of rough months. Uh, you know, is, is there anything you can do kind of? within the book or, or things you, you work on with your clients to kind of help shelter those times when things aren't going great? So yeah, I definitely talk about that in the book. In the book, I call it the real estate rat race. I mean, you're literally living deal to deal and just spinning your, you know, spinning in circles. So I also write an entire chapter on this. It's chapter six, where reserves help grow your company, where you need to set up a specific account for reserves, not touch it because you are as a real estate investor, you're going to have the months where you're just killing it. Absolutely. Six, seven figures. I mean, just crazy months. Then you're going to have the $0 month, you know, where it's like, okay, we're doing 20 deals a month. What happened? Like, how did we just close two? You know, so that's where if you say, what do we want for our business? And is that three months? Is that six months? Because obviously the, the general wisdom is three months, you know, at least to be able to have a quarter. So that way you could say, how do no deals in a quarter and still be okay. And that's where I devote a whole chapter of like reserves help grow the business because I know, I know as a real estate investor myself, lazy money to us is just like a cardinal sin. You know, like I can't have money in an account or it's just burning a hole in my pocket. So, but that would be one big way to get off that roller coaster, that up and down, knowing that it get, there's just so many benefits for that peace of mind that helps you get private lenders or lenders to make sure that they can fund you. Cause they like seeing cash in accounts. Like there's a lot of different ways that it helps you versus just having money sit there. It's for a lot of different reasons, but that would be one big way to, to get off that roller coaster. That's awesome. So, um, that's your like main business. Are you still doing real estate, real estate investing, all that good stuff on the side, or is this is like your main focus now? I was going to say, I sold everything to start this. And now that I'm here and settling down in Florida, I'm going to start ramping it back up again. But yeah, I'm still got the real estate bug for sure. But no, I've still at this time, I've sold everything that, that I had. No, I, th- I think it's interesting because I think it's smart of you to kind of like, let's stop. I know I can start it up again. I already have the information and knowledge to do it again. Yep. That's not the problem. Let me, let me stop and refocus and get this up and running that we can yep. focus on your priorities. Exactly. That's been a big point for me is focus. And that's it. That, and so many things I've learned over the years from watching other people of just like what to do, what not to do. And like focus is the one thing that everyone always talks about. And it is once you have your own business, it is hard because it's not only focus for your business and like all the shiny objects that come there. But it's like, if I've done something else too, I still like that stuff, still want to do it, but I have to, it has to be intentional and it has to fit in line with the overall vision. So if I found the perfect partner and they were doing it and I could just supply the money, okay, 
like sign me up. I'll partner with you. Let's get it done. But like, besides that, it's like, at this point, I have to be very selective of how I use my time as well too. Cause that's something too, you know, and you probably, I don't know if you struggle with this too, Daniel, but coming from a uh, background of like working your truck driving, I come from like the, the railroad industry slash working in a business, you know, like working, helping with the investors. Sometimes it's like, I like doing the urgent and like doing that type of stuff. And it's like, I need to focus on what's good for the overall business. What really is that highest and best use of my time? So that's one other thing that has been really, really uh, key for, you know, staying on track of like, and growing as a business owner of like, okay, no, there's sometimes I'm not going to get to that thing, even though it's urgent, it's just not important right now. I need to do these other things that are very important and the overarching goal. So yeah, it's like right now for me, real estate would come up if found the perfect partner. And if I could just apply the, you know, the, the, the money or whatnot too, because that's about what I'd be good for at this point. Cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to be on the phone. I'm not going to be talking to sellers. I'm not going to be doing that type of stuff anytime soon. I would much rather partner with someone. You're, you're retired. Right. I'm like, yeah, I'll supply the deal. I'll supply the deal for the money for the deals here. But like, I don't want to be out there running deals at this point. That's awesome. Um, so how, 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 when did you start this? When did you kind of stop and pivot into this, into this thing? How yeah. did you get this? So it's been about two and a half years now. And we've seen, we've been working with a lot of investors right now. We're at about 50 on a monthly basis that we're working with, um, you know, on a fractional CFO basis. And, you know, that's been a passion of mine, just seeing people go from broke or spinning in their rat race to now having money in these different accounts, having true cash profit and being able to do what they want. So yeah, it's been about two and a half years now of helping those people get out of the rat race. So I have a question. Bring it on. What, what, what's the difference between real estate wholesale versus um, reoccurring income? So other than like real estate wholesale, I feel like it's just an ATM machine, uh -huh. you know, like that you go out there and it's a one hit wonder. You have to have amazing people and processes for that to even be recurring, but it's never going to truly be recurring. Uh, the recurring is amazing. You know, like that, it, whether that's rentals, multifamily, a software services, whatever that might be subscriptions, you know, like that's where you you're building that base because we have clients like that. We have clients who have wholesale deals and we have clients who have wholesale deals and rentals. And we have clients with rentals and the people that have rentals, they're trying to build it to a base of like, just to take care of my needs. We have one client who achieved that, like their rentals could take care of their needs. So any flips or wholesale deals, icing on the cake, you know, cause they now had their recurring, like in Rich Dad Poor Dad, you know, they, and the cash flow 101, they got out of the rat race, you know, like with their recurring, you know, subscription or whatever. Now it's just rentals that are replacing that. But then that other stuff is icing on the cake. But a lot of people use the wholesale or whatnot to then get into the rentals and buy the long-term or buy the multifamily or the commercial buildings or whatnot. So that's where, yeah, I'm definitely a huge fan of the recurring and the rentals and the cash flow subscriptions and that type of stuff because there's a lot of security in that. Way more, especially if you, like you guys, like if you're providing a service that is literally helping people make money and literally getting them out of their rat race. There is no feeling like that of being able to have a successful business that's helping others and also is recurring as well too. Because now month after month, we're going to keep helping these people. So yeah, I could go on and on about that all day long. But yeah, there's definitely a big difference to me between the wholesale business and the recurring. Is there any sweet spots with uh, kind of cool or niche businesses you've seen clients uh, own that is part of the recurring revenue or subscription model, maybe something you haven't thought of uh, prior? Hmm. I'd have to think about that. We're working with a lot of people in the real estate investing space. One person has a speedboat rentals, but I guess that, you know, that could be recurring if they have enough, you know, income coming in or enough uh, recurring people coming back. But no, I, I guess I haven't seen that except for people are in software or have coaching packages or whatnot, or have these different types of things where that, you know, like programs and whatnot. So we work with a lot of real estate investors and a lot of real estate influencers as well, too. So the ones that are out there doing the work, but also teaching a lot of people. So that's a lot of the recurring that we type, we typically see. Is there a, a good success story? I'm sure you have many with the clients that you work with, but 
maybe somebody you worked with early that was struggling, yeah. uh, whether it be with cash flow and, and some of the systems you implemented with them and maybe where they've taken off to kind of thanks to your guidance. So talk about him a little in the book, but there's a guy that came to us at right when I started. So like 2019 and he said, like, I just lost $70,000. I have a flipping business and I lost $70,000 in my flipping business. My rental business is okay, but not that big. So that was a big hit for us. And, you know, I started, to, we started talking to him and then, you know, I told him, yeah, I'd love to help you. Here's the, here's the pricing. And he went home to his wife and said, I don't know if we, you know, we really need this. Don't know if we can afford it. And she even said, I don't know if we can't afford, you know, can't afford not to do this. So came on board with us. And right away, he just took it like a duck to water. What we were saying, like, there's a lot of people that still struggle, even though they pay for the service and they come on board, they still struggle in turning of like, should I really do this with my cash? And like, do I really want to focus on this? But he took it and ran with it. So he started implementing what we were saying. We started teaching him, you know, like as a business owner, what the different financial statements meant and how he could actually utilize those to make decisions. Then we started implementing profit first, getting his cash in good order. And so that after a year of doing that, great story here, he called me because he had just got off the phone with his CPA. The year before when he lost 70,000, when his CPA told him she, that CPA said, you know, like in your foot, you're with your flicks and flip business. If I ever thought about doing that, I never do that in a million years, you know, kind of like saying, yeah, no, thanks. So then the next year she calls him and says, whoa, what turned around? Like, this is amazing. So in, he, cause she called and said, yeah, you did really well. You had, you know, multiple six figures on your bottom line. So here's what your tax liability is. And first the client said like, this is amazing. You know, and it told me like, this is the first time I've paid taxes in like years. Cause I'm actually profitable, you know, so profitable on my flipping side, like more profitable than even the offsetting rentals, you know, like to get me down on my tax liability. So she said, you know, here's what you owe. And he tells her, okay, that's how much I owe. Let me look at my bank account. So he like literally pulls up his bank accounts and says, oh, I've got this tax account here, a uh, profit and, you know, um, income tax account. And he said, how much was it? Told him again. And he's like, you know what? I have it down to the penny almost. Like I'm a hundred dollars off. I'll send it to you right now. She said, what? Like, put, like right now? Cause this was like January of the, of the following year. And she said, and he said, yeah, let me just send it to you now and take this off my plate. I don't want to worry about it again. So she did that. You know, he sent it off. She took the money and then there you go. Like he was done for the year. He said that was the best thing ever. Well, then he calls me this last year. So he calls me again at the end of 2021 and said, I just had the same call with my, my CPA because we're still working with them. And she told me again, like, great job this year, had a great bottom line. Here's how much you owe this year. And so he said, okay, let me pull up my accounts again and pulls up his accounts. He's got like 20,000 extra in his accounts. He's like, I'm giving myself a tax refund this year. So like he did, he was able to take all that money out. Didn't affect his operations, didn't affect his liability, didn't affect anything. And he was able to take that money out and pay himself a refund. So that's one of my favorite stories. This guy's like the poster child though, because he set up a profit account too, and like able to buy an RV from that and like take a two week vacation with his family. He's got young kids, puts pours a lot of time and effort into them as well too and like really wants to invest in them so he's used a lot of that money for family and vacations set up on a giving account too like to give to start a a charity and like a, a camp for children of his organization and like his um, church or whatnot and like gave a, a significant five-figure sum to them at the end of 2021 so it was just that was one of the best success stories that we have working with someone um, that really took it and ran with it that's fantastic. Was there any other specific kind of business advice you gave? It sounds like you got the books in order, kind of gave them a framework about how to, um, you know, structure their, their different accounts. Yep. So, you know, you have a tax account, you have your other accounts. Um, it sounds like this guy also made a ton of money too <laughs> in the couple right. of years also. Were there any kind of specific business advice you might have given to kind of get him over the threshold there? So he works with the CFO on a weekly basis with us. And one of the big things in that first year was he was trying to do a lot of deals and with his staff and with him just running ragged and he hated flipping at that time. And so we sat down with him and said, what do you really need? And what do you really want? Cause that's one of our first steps is like, what do you need to survive and where do you want to end up? Where do you want to be? And then they figured it out. He only had to flip like one property a quarter and he had, you know, like 20 or 30 rentals. And like with that income, he was able to sustain himself. Anything above that was 
icing on the cake. So that's what he did. He slowed down and actually did less deals, but made way more profit than he had ever done in the history of his life before for the last two years, because he said, this is the amount of deals I need to do for what I need. And then being able to say, this is how many deals I need to do to not only sustain me, to sustain the business and to have the profit that I want. So being able to utilize the numbers to say, you don't have to do more deals. You just have to do, you know, you could do less deals, but be more profitable. And so other people too, we go in there and look at their books. They're like, you want to do more deals? Well, then here's what we need to do. And here's where we need to get your profitability so you can invest in the business and grow and hire more people or whatnot. But for him, it was slowing down because that was, that's, I think that's a question that everyone asks themselves at one point in business is like, do I want to keep scaling and growing and grinding and going and, you know, like sell this off one day? Or, and some of us have to search internally, do we want to slow down? do less deals and just be very, very profitable. And so for him, he had that choice now, now that he saw his numbers, had a handle on his cash flow, he was even able to make that decision now and like have that conversation of like, which way do I wanna go? So for him, he's like, my kids are young. I'd rather go slower right now. I'd rather not build it as fast and as much as I thought I wanted to and what every mastermind was telling me. So I was like, let me do less deals, but be more profitable. So that was kind of like a big decision he had to make that we kind of guided him through. That's interesting. And, and, you know, Daniel, think about that. Like you get kind of in the rat race of go, go, go deal, deal, deal. And, you know, to step back a little bit and think about, Hey, you know, what if I did a few less deals, trying to do bigger deals, more money involved, uh, but not have to feel like you're on the hamster wheel at all time at all times that, uh, you know, to be able to put that in place and see the, the profits and the revenue kind of soar by doing a little bit less, I think is appealing to, to any investor. So uh, that, that's an incredible story. Yeah. And that's what I, that's the point of the book. Like, even if you want to grow a team, you should be doing less than like the less you do, the more money you make your, you are going to get to the point. I had someone else on the podcast and they said something that has stuck with me very much. They said, at this point, they're hiring thinkers, not doers. I'm hiring people for their brains now, not their hands. You know, so like when you first start out, you need an admin. You need someone to take these tasks off your plate. But as you start growing, you're going to need to hire people for their brain if you want to grow big. That people that are smarter than you, people that might intimidate you, but people that will actually get you where you want to go because what got you here won't get you there, wherever you are. But that same thing, if you want to stay small as an operator, then you also need to see that the less you do, the more you're able to just think or connect the dots or like have your few team members work, the more money you can actually make from staying small because now you're just focused on squeezing the profitability from everything without having this huge overhead or without you know the scaling and growth that everyone thinks that they want when they really want is the financial freedom they got into business for and the time freedom they got into business for. Why sacrifice that now when you think I'm gonna have this big payoff in the future if you could do some of that today. So yeah, it's a, it's a big thing for sure with us. That's amazing, man. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm definitely the finance guy, but I'm never like, yay finances. Right. I know. That's why, <laughs> that's why I love the profit first aspect because it makes something that's very unsexy, a little bit sexier than, you know, than it is because accounting, no one, like if I say the word accounting, CPA, finances, QuickBooks, like all that, just everyone tunes out. But yeah. this is where, that's why I got lit on fire with profit first, because it's more, this is your cash. You're going to have to deal with your cash, whether you touch your books or not. Like you're going to have to deal with the money that comes in and out of your business. And you're going to really have to dig into that to make sure you know where you are. So yes, finances, I get it, are not going to excite a lot of entrepreneurs, but what they return is the biggest thing that we're all looking for because the first part is sales. You have to have sales, but if you have sales, you have to have that finance piece. So that way you're not just spinning your wheels. Cause if you just keep dumping in and dumping in and dumping in without a net to catch the money, then why are you doing this? You know, like, why are you on this rat race if you don't have something to actually catch it? And like someone there on your team saying, this is what profitability looks like. Like, stop, stop doing this. Stop doing that. Like, why is this still what you wanted to do? You know, then we have to stay on focus for, you know, making sure you're getting to where you actually want to be as a business owner. Mm, that's amazing. So what, what, what's the time frame does it take 
is it like three months, six months? Like what, what is it, what does it really take to get a handle on your numbers? Like you do it by the quarter? Well, I would say it depends on where you are in your business. Cause if you are that person who's like started the business and you're three years down the road and have nothing in place, it's going to take a little bit longer. What we do for people is we do a 60 day upfront process called laying the financial foundation. It's a 60 day program of implementing profit first, getting your numbers in order too, as long as they're not just a total raving mess of years and years and years. So that's usually where we try and say 60 days, let's get you to at least square one. I know my numbers. I could have a dashboard built, you know, of my financial KPIs and my projections. I could have a profit first dashboard as well too. Where's my money going? Where's it's been? And where is it right now? And how do I need to transfer it? So that's kind of the time frame that we try and with a lot of people that come to us that needing the help in the implementation. Wow. So what is what is? And I'm, I'm gonna jump back to business. Yeah. I think I think uh, you've said some some really key insights I really want to focus on. Yeah. So I like that you're at the point where like, I don't want to redo business from scratch. I want to oh, partner yeah. with people. So how, how important is people and finding the right people in your business? There's a great book, CEO Only Does Three Things by Trey Taylor. And those three things are culture, people, and numbers. If you're okay. in that CEO box, you are responsible for the culture of the people that are already there and creating that intentionally. You are responsible for getting the right people in the right seat because that is paramount as the CEO. And then the numbers, making sure your numbers are on track and everyone's being held accountable across the board. So I would say it's pretty dang important to have the right people there on your team because that is, you, you think about it, to enable for you, the business owner, to be elevated out of all these seats that everyone sits in and just scrambling, you have to hire the amazing people. That's why you can't always just have a virtual assistant. I'm a huge proponent of virtual assistants. I love virtual assistants. I still work with one from like day one of the real estate world. So like for the last eight to 10 years, I've been working with the same guy. So no knock on virtual assistants, but you have to elevate yourself to say, I need people who are smarter than me and be very humble to say, I've got this vision because what draws them to you, even though they're smarter than you, is that you took the risk, you have the vision and you have a culture of winning and letting them win and getting them to where they want to be. As long as you're focused on, I want to make sure they're making so much money. Why would they ever go anywhere else? You know, like, and I'm providing this culture of why would they go anywhere else? Because I'm taking care of them and they know that I care about them too. So I would say having the right people and then taking care of them are those one, two punch of like, that is how you really elevate yourself as an entrepreneur and business owner and leader. So you said you love VAs, but you're, you're saying you need a more a step up from that when you hit a certain level, right? I was going to say, yeah. If you want someone who's on your team, that's a, that integrator, that's going to be your partner, then that's where kind of that guy was saying, I hire people for their brains, not their hands. I feel like with virtual assistants, most of them are going to be the hardest worker on your team. They're going to be the ones that are there, show up, do those things. If they're the right person, then they're going to be just working. What can I do? I'm going to get it done for you because that's how my guy is. And that's how a lot of people are that have virtual assistants. But I don't need a bunch of those people. I, who, what do I really need? I need a bunch of people as well, too, that can think and say, here's the problem. Here's the solution. And I didn't even have to go to David you know, because I know how he thinks and I know that what's best for the business to be able to get across this goal line. And I'm going to make those decisions and help my department do its best. So yes, I think at some point you have to think about, that's why I preach profit first too. You have to have money for this stuff. Like if you want the best people, you're going to have to have money, you know, like you're going to have to pay them. So that's where I'm just saying, that's where I've seen a lot of the most successful real estate investors flip the switch from how can I get the cheapest of everything to how can I get the most expensive of everything? How can I get the person who is worth $250,000 to be my COO and right-hand person and pay them that money because they're going to be bringing in five, six, 10 times that in the year because of the systems, the people, the processes that they put in place. Wow. Never heard that one before. There you go. <laughs> it basically comes down that you get what you pay for, right? You know, yeah, exactly. You... Exactly. You get what you pay for, for the most part. Yeah. David, can you touch on, uh, for people who maybe don't want to take on a 50-50 partner and maybe they're more interested in hiring employees, VAs, yeah. and uh, you know, being the, the, the at the top of the company themselves, 
you know, what does that process look like in your eyes in terms of, you know, some people want to partner and be 50, 50, that's fantastic. Some people don't. Um, what, what is the line? Uh, where's that kind of line in the sand for you in terms of what you would need to do kind of working with a partner to build the culture versus like just being, being the CEO yourself and hiring everyone below you. So that's what this business is for me. I know I like partnerships, but I built the, the simple CFO from the ground up and I'm hundred percent owner. So I could speak to that of that you have to be very intentional of at each stage, hiring the right people for the stage. When I first started, it was one, the one virtual assistant with me as my admin that I had worked with for forever because I needed someone there to help me with the tasks. But then you start hiring other people. If you really know where you're going to, because that's another moving target when you're first getting started is what do I want to do? What value do I provide the market? Once you figure that out and you can clarify that, that's when you can get very intentional of like, these are the people, the key people I will need on my team. This is how I'm going to take care of them. But then it is, it's just being intentional with them, setting the culture, having, I do weekly meetings with the whole entire team. Like on Wednesday, tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to run a culture meeting of like, here's what, here's the wins for the week, celebrate them with the team. Here's some training or some things. Yeah. I want to hear from them too. story, good stories from them. You know, it's like building those into the culture of the company as you grow and, you know, like running on an operating system that encourages that building of the culture along the way too. You just have to be very intentional and you have to build a certain set of skills. So if you're going to do it all alone and you aren't going to have a partnership, which is totally fine, like a lot of people do, they have 100% ownership, then you are going to have to learn how to be that leader as you grow, as you scale and say, okay, this time, this month, I need to learn on how to, how to build a better culture. This month, I need to learn on how to hire the right people and where am I going to find them? So that's where you as the individual are going to have to have your personal growth. That's why I love business too. I feel like if I wouldn't have started this, I, there's no way I'd be reading, uh, reading all these books and like doing all these things. Like, you know, it feels like if you put yourself in that position, you're going to, you're going to rise to where you want to be. So like, for me, it was very self-motivating of like, especially as you bring more team members on, I have to be, I have to grow in order to provide them what they need and in order for us to get to the next level. So I would say it's just a lot of personal growth, mentorship, masterminds, good people like this podcast. It's like getting that foundation, then finding more of your, your culture, your, your fit, your values, and then finding those mentors and people around you that can help you get to the next levels. One of the things you mentioned earlier was um, for people's first hire, you'd recommend a, a admin slash bookkeeper. Um, past that, is there kind of a, a set of hires you see and uh, people you work with and you know, okay, so admin, bookkeeper first, what comes after that in the real estate world? Let's say you're wholesaling, you're trying to build rental portfolios, you're in lead generation, you're bringing in leads to try to convert. Uh, what, do you, what would be the next couple of logical hires in your mind? So if the owner really loves sales, it might be a transaction coordinator to stop him from doing the actual, getting it across the goal line. If he's like, I don't like, if he or she doesn't like the sales, then it's usually an acquisitions person. Like, how can I stop running appointments? You know, like, how do I stop going to this? A lot of people keep dispositions with the owner for a while, you know, and selling the properties, you know, that's usually a hire that doesn't get hired out till later. Um, because usually if you're doing wholesale deals, then a lot of them can sell themselves um, because they're so, you know, like, because there's meat on the bone if you're a good wholesaler. So that's where I see probably those two positions, either sales and the acquisitions or transaction coordinator if the owner really loves going on the appointments until they want to get out of that seat. I got a question. Okay. So are, are you 100% virtual or you have an in-office that you people show up to? My, my company is 100% virtual. As fractional CFOs, we don't provide full-time people on people's staff. So one CFO could be working with three or four companies because we're not, you know, a typical CFO, easily $150,000, $250,000. You're looking in that range. And most small businesses, small entrepreneurs, and even medium sized don't need a full-time CFO on their staff. So wow. we have fractional CFOs to help with the business strategy, the implementations, like everything we've talked about, but we're all virtual. So that way we can handle several of those types of clients across wherever we are. So we've got people on the West Coast, East Coast, everywhere in between. Your office is virtual too? Like all your people work Mm -hmm. so, okay, so I have, I, have a, I have a reason why I went down this way because how do you build culture? Because I feel it's a lot harder building culture when you're virtual, 100% virtual, than versus in office. Because in office, you can always 
put the core values on the wall, you know, there's something you can physically look at. Like how, how, how do you build culture virtually with your people? The same way as you do in office intentionally, because even if you have the core values on the wall, who cares? Well, are you talking about them? Are you living them? Are you, are you recognizing people for that? Same thing virtually. Do you talk about it? Do you hold people accountable to those? Do you talk, do you have meetings where you call out to people specifically of how they embody the core, you know, a core value of yours? So it's like, that's where I'm very intentional on our meetings of being, honestly, the CEO is the cheerleader. Let the operations and let the other people be the accountability and the bad guy. Let the owner be the cheerleader to say, we're here. Here's the vision. Here's the culture. I believe in you guys. Let's go. You know, and like, that's what, that's even on virtual teams. It's letting them know that. All of a sudden, we've got Slack. A lot of virtual teams use Slack or some communication channel like that. So it's like sending messages out to the entire team. You know, like here, you know, like here's a win. We have culture. We have a good news and win channel where if CFOs have a win with their clients, they're putting it in there and all of, everyone gets to celebrate the win for that person. So it's like being intentional with those types of things. We send people books. We send people gifts. You know, it's like just... Like I said, you could do this in office or you could do this virtually. It's just being intentional and thinking, what can I do with the people that are virtual and how can I make them feel special? I'm going to do that. I need a wind channel. That's good. That was a good one right there. A wind channel. I like that. Man, I think the word I've been hearing a lot lately is intentional. It's been like the key. I've been hearing it come up so many times in different conversations. I'm like being intentional, having a purpose to what you're doing to make sure you get the outcome you want. Yeah. It is key. It is the key. I think you'd be for anything. I mean, you're not going to just wake up and become rich. You're not going to wake up and your culture is going to be good either, but you are building a culture, whether you do it or not. If you're not building a culture, you are building a culture. You're building a culture where people know you don't care, you know? So it's like, that's where you're building one or the other. So that's where you have to be intentional with these things, especially as the owner the owner, it does rise and fall on you. It does. I mean, and that's a lot of responsibility, but that's where we put ourselves, you know? So if it's like, if we're going to do that, we have to be intentional and then think about it. Like we have like, Dan, you and I have young kids, you know? So it's like, you got to be intentional all around. Like, where's the time for that family? Where's the time for the business? How do I build the culture here? How do I make sure that my daughter loves me? You know, like, how do I make sure that I have time with my wife on the weekends and at night, you know, it's like making sure that we're building that in as well too so it's it goes a lot farther than just business it's like how are you being intentional with all the different relationships in your life because like like a lot of people say when you get i think of this a lot i know it's cliche but when you get to the end of your life what are you really going to say that i'm glad i worked those extra hours you know i'm glad i did those things i'm glad i you know whatnot or like that my kid actually likes me you know so it's like being intentional with the right things too and i think that is conveyed in my messages as well too because like some, a lot of people, they can't reach me after a certain time or, you know, like they can't in the mornings, like I don't schedule things in the early morning. Cause that's when I play with my daughter, you know, so my team knows I'm there for them. I will go to bat for them. I have fired clients for them, you know, because they've been belligerent. So they know I'm there to, for their back, but they also know too, that I've got a set of core values where I'm not going to sacrifice my morning time with my girl, you know, and playing with her in the morning. So it's like also being intentional in those other areas too, that help the business as well too of showing like hey this person is actually like trying to be you know doing good things in other areas of his life too so just to go back to your building culture virtually setting some of those parameters in place help the overall culture as well too because it shows who you really are and what you're trying to do so yeah intentionality is a big part of it okay so i know you're i know you're a bookworm what how are can your, you tell <laughs> i'm not so i know you are so yeah. like, what's your top favorite five books? Cause I'm not, I'm not going to ask one. Cause I'm sure you have like, five. I know you can, you can name a good five. You're, you're oh, I can name a really good five. So right now, cause I'm going to say right now, cause it always changes. And yeah. I'm sure I could think of 10 other ones that I didn't mention to you. One of them would be obviously be profit first, especially for real estate investing. One of them, this ultimate blueprint for a highly six, for an insanely successful business by Keith Cunningham. Incredible. So I would put that on the top of my list. Another one up here, Expert Secrets by Russell Brunson. I'm a big Russell Brunson fan. Um, So his Expert Secrets book is incredible. If you want to become an expert in your area and really provide value and drive raving fans to you, 
Um, also, let's see, because I've got a ton that I'm going through. Let me give you another one that's a little different. Um, Think Again by Adam Grant. I've read that a couple times. That's just, that probably unlocked my mind to a lot of the stuff where I grew up thinking I had to think a certain way. And it's like questioning everything. So that's one where if you want a good one to stretch your mind of how you think, um, that book, Think Again, is another good one. I'm reading a bunch of parenting books too. So, you know, like I'm, I'm reading all over the place, but Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, that's a really good one as well too, because emotional intelligence goes a lot with what you were talking about, culture, intentionality, yeah. like being able to emotionally handle other people's problems as well as your own is a very specific set of skills as well too. So that would probably be another one that I would throw out there as a really, People don't really good book. The CEO has to be the counselor, the underpaid counselor. Right? Yeah, exactly. They're the therapist uh, for sure. Okay. Bonus. Here's a bonus, two other books for raising children. One is Raising Lions by Joe Newman. So if you have a little uh, five-year-old girl like me or boy that just loves to display their omnipotence at every turn, that's a really good one for the non-traditional way of like getting discipline inside the home and um, even working with the school and whatnot. It's a really good book, Raising Lions. Then another one is The Family Board Meeting by Jim Shields and tells you about how to spend quality time at least once a quarter with your kids and with your significant other and like gives a framework for that, which is super short book. That one's only like 50 or 60 pages. So like, even if you're not a bookworm, you could flip through that in an hour or less maybe. And like, that's a really, really short book of like giving a framework for how to spend intentional time with, with the people in your life that really matter. So those are two bonus books that I've read recently that are really good. Gotcha. Oh, uh, what is a quote that is yours or somebody else's that you resonate with? Ah, oh, profit is a habit, not an event. So make profit a habit inside of your business, inside your personal life. Don't think it's something that's way out there at the end of your life or the end of your year. Wow. Okay. That was a good there, one. There's been so many good gems here. This has just been, uh, this has been really, good. really cool. And I've really enjoyed this conversation. Awesome. Well, I try to provide value. That's why I wrote this book. Like people need to stop living in the rat race. Like there's a way out and there's a simple way out. But like you said, Daniel, a lot of people don't like that side of the business. But usually the biggest gold nuggets are those places you don't want to touch. A lot of people don't want to touch the finances, but that's usually how to get yourself out of the rat race. So yeah, I appreciate you guys having me on. I love, I love spreading this message. So really appreciate being here today. David, yeah. is there anywhere specifically uh, people should go to find your book or is it just yeah. kind of where, wherever else you would normally buy your books? So simplecfosolutions.com leads you down the rabbit hole of David Richter of like the book, the podcast, working with us, my Facebook, LinkedIn, like it's a one-stop shop if you want to start following more about here in Profit First for Real Estate Investing or what we do. So simplecfosolutions.com and also my book's available on Amazon. So that's where several thousand real estate investors have purchased the book already and want to just get that message out more. So would love to be a part of your real estate investing journey. Awesome. Awesome. So um, any final thoughts, final word, final drop of knowledge? If anything, if you could take one message away, because I didn't go into like the specifics of profit first, so pick up the book. But besides that, open one new bank account. Remember how I said one of the biggest mistakes is yeah. everyone has their, you know, like the big one big bank account where everything goes in and out. At least open one other bank account, call it profit and transfer 1% of all your future income to get into the habit of being profitable. So just do that. If you can do that one step, get into that habit, start seeing that profit build. I promise you come back a year from now as you start growing that percentage too, as you can see that, okay, I can do more than this, that you will have way more money than you've ever had inside your business because you listen to that one piece of advice. There you go. We appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, uh, David.